Let's look at four reasons why we can't really compare Japanese sword preservation with medieval European sword preservation. Hi folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria and Easton Antique Arms. Now, um, I just recently posted a uh, really interesting article about an amazing sword found in Japan in a temple in 1939, found by chance, incidentally, because there was a leak in the roof, in the roof, in the fabric and structure of a temple roof that had been sitting there since, well, since at some point hundreds of years ago, but it was a 12th century sword, so it probably hadn't been sitting there hidden in the roof for the whole of that time. At some point, maybe in the 15th, 16th, 17th century, who knows, it was uh, stored up in the roof and it had been preserved there. Now it has been repolished, and I'll come back to that point. But the simple fact is, it is incredible to have a 12th century sword that you can now view in beautiful polished condition like this uh, brand new example here uh, with this you know you can see all the structure of the grain in the steel you can the hudder you can see the uh, ham on perfectly everything to do with you know it's now super sharp you could use it as a weapon straight away and it's amazing to people who study European swords, uh, I think, a lot of us, to see swords in this condition when they date to the 12th century. Let's put this in European terms. The 12th century, this is the time of the Crusades. Uh, I mean, it's, it's mental uh, that this sword is in such beautiful, great condition. And it, you know, it could go back to the time of Richard the Lionheart and Philip Augustus and people like this. But there are four points that mean that we shouldn't get carried away and we shouldn't write straight, uh, make a straight direct analogue comparison between the preservation of Japanese swords and European medieval swords. The first reason why we shouldn't do that is that swords of a relatively similar design remained in continual use in Japan. If we look at the Heian period all the way back to the 12th century um, uh, Tachi, and then we look at a 16th century uh, Uchigadana, and then we come forwards to an 18th century Katana, and then we look at a 20th century Shingunto, they're fundamentally a similar design. And that's with certain caveats and certain exceptions, that's not really the case in Europe. The fact is that uh, a Roman Spatha uh, looks relatively different, developed into the Viking era sword. Medieval arming swords of the uh, 11th, 12th century look quite different to medieval arming swords of the 15th century. And then we get into uh, things like uh, long swords, and then we get into things like um, side swords, massive great uh, spadone, spadone, side swords, rapiers, small swords, sabers, basket hilted swords. There is an enormous amount of variety and develop, development in European swords, which meant that if you were someone living in the 17th, 18th century, a medieval arming sword, apart from being a relic, unless it was associated with a famous person, wouldn't be of enormous uh, use or interest to you. It would be regarded as archaic and a thing to put away, um, perhaps even a thing to throw away, or perhaps even recycle in some cases, but it's not a contemporary weapon of now. In Japan, however, very different situation. And here I have uh, one of the antiques from my own collection, this being a Kanban period 17th century um, katana in its present form uh, with later Edo fittings. And there's a clue right there. So here we've got a 17th century blade with 19th century hilt fittings, uh, perhaps an 18th, 19th century suba. Um, but we've got parts of different periods that are still in use in the 19th century. And not only that, this blade has been modified and changed. So they, uh, this has lost about six inches of its length. It's now about, uh, probably less than that, probably more like four inches of its length. Uh, based on the holes in the Nakago or Tang, we can see that the Tang has been shortened. So the shoulder where the super sits has moved up the blade to make this into a shorter sword. But you can see it's in pretty lovely condition and we can clearly see the structure of the blade, we can see the hamon. And the simple fact is that swords like this were still in widespread use going into the 19th century, even if they had been originally made, in this case in the 17th century, but uh, even if they'd been made in the 15th, 14th, all the way back to the 12th century, sometimes even earlier. So the fact is that for hundreds of years these blades could be reused in up-to-date hilts, and they hadn't changed drastically, not drastically enough as they had in Europe, 
uh, such that they weren't used anymore. The fact is they were continually used uh, throughout Japanese history. So therefore they were looked after, cherished, when the medieval swords in many cases were disposed of. Now the next topic, the second on my list to mention is the fact that this is specifically this example and that article's linked below incidentally, is a temple preservation. Now that is a very particular type of preservation and we have to point out that in many cases things were put into temples in Japan and they stayed there for hundreds of years. Now not to say that we don't sometimes have situations like this in Europe. Uh, there are cases as was pointed out on our Facebook page, um, there are cases where there have been Scandinavian swords that have by chance uh, survived uh, over a long period of you know hundreds of years, thousand years, um, that have been either handed down within a family or in some cases, in one case, trapped in the ice uh, up in Scandinavia where it wasn't, uh, it didn't corrode to the degree that it would have done if it had been in a slightly warmer country, for example, like, uh, like England or France. So um, in some cases, yes indeed, there are European swords which are observed and indeed in churches. Now there are some famous examples, swords associated with Charlemagne, with El Cid, various, you know, St. Maurice, various um, sort of heroes and martyred people, saints, swords associated with them that have been kept in treasuries, in some cases royal treasuries and sometimes in churches, that have been preserved to a high degree. And if you look at the coronation sword of the French kings, for example, bright and shiny sword, blade maybe dating back to, well, there's debates around that, probably not the time of Charlemagne, probably more like about the 11th century, um, and a hilt perhaps a, maybe a little bit later than that. Uh, but there is a, 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 an Avar type sabre associated with Charlemagne, which probably dates to um, maybe about a hundred years after his time. So it is a thousand year old sword in really great condition. So there are swords in Europe which have been preserved like this if they have an exceptional provenance, that is if they belonged to or were associated with a particularly famous person and were treasured and kept in a place where they weren't disrupted. Now remember in Europe there have been many upheavals, there have been civil wars, there have been religious changes from Catholicism to Protestantism in many countries, um, there have been uh, widespread looting and burning of churches, even fast forward to World War I and World War II, there were cathedrals that were bombed flat um, and shelled flat in World War I and World War II. So there are relics that have been lost that did exist. This to some degree in Japan, yes of course Japan has also been invaded numerous times and has also uh, been bombed most famously in World War II, but the fact is that there are temple uh, possessions which have stayed in the possession of those temples for hundreds and in some cases up to a thousand years. So um, that is one thing we have to bear in mind is that in some cases these temples have had something for hundreds of years and yes that does occasionally happen in Europe but it's not usually the case. Now my third point is really built on the second point and I'm just going to mention it briefly and that's to do with find location and you've got to compare like with like. So when we're looking at a Japanese sword from a temple don't compare it to a medieval European sword which has come out of a river. Maybe compare a Japanese sword which has come out of a river. Now funnily enough uh, I'm aware of the fact that quite a lot of Japanese weapons come out of rivers and out of the ground archaeologically but they don't get very much attention either in the West or indeed in Japan because they're not bright and shiny um, and preserved and polished temple swords that look great on an article. And so the simple fact is that yes there were hundreds and thousands, in fact tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of Japanese swords that went into rivers or went into the ground during battles and campaigns and just general their lifespan that we don't know about or that they don't get widely publicised because they're in a corroded condition like a lot of the European swords. Um, so the simple fact that in Japan they had this culture of putting swords into temples um, and keeping them within families and keeping them within use, which didn't happen in Europe, by and large, with the exception of saints' swords and famous kings' swords, coronation swords, things like this. Because we don't have that direct comparison, it's not a fair comparison to make. So compare like with like. If we're looking at archaeologically found European swords, look at archaeological Japanese swords as a comparison. If we're looking at a temple sword from Japan, then compare it's like, compare something like the coronation sword of Charlemagne, 
or um, or as I said, the the Avar sword associated with him, or the um, Elector Count swords that exist in uh, parts of Germany and Austria, or um, the um, Ettore Visconti sword in Milan, um, things like this. So we've got to compare it like with like. If you're looking at something that's been preserved in a temple in Japan, looking at look at something that's been preserved in a cathedral or a royal or imperial armory in Europe. Now my fourth and final point is actually the one I want to convey the most and really what inspired me to make this video and it seems to be something that a lot of people who are relatively casually interested in the world of swords, you maybe do fencing, you maybe collect swords and hang them on your wall or do a bit of backyard cutting but you're not necessarily in the industry like I am in the in antique industry or you know I've been spending the last uh, 20 25 years of my life fully um, sort of immersed in this stuff and I think it's not widely realized and that is when people see a nice bright shiny Japanese sword and someone tells you this is 17th century and then you look at a 17th century European sword and it doesn't look as uh, in good condition usually and then uh, maybe they tell you that this is a 12th century sword like the sword in the article linked below um, and you look at that blade and you think well that is a super shiny uh, amazing sword, what amazing preservation. But here's the elephant in the room. It's been re-polished, okay? Let's just focus on that for a second. That sword did not come out of the rafters of that temple in that condition. In Japan, there is a culture of keeping sword blades in sharp, serviceable, polished condition. And a sword is known as out of polish or in polish. Now funnily enough this sword might look nice and shiny to you but a lot of people would regard this as out of polish. Why don't I send it off for hand polishing by a qualified and certified polisher? Because it would cost too much. Uh, because this is not economically uh, viable. I could do it as a, as a labour of love but uh, for the amount of money I would spend on getting this traditionally polished, possibly sending it to Japan or one of the good polishers in America, it would cost more money than this sword would ever be worth. So therefore, when we look at these extremely valuable swords of national treasures, national importance in Japan, they have been repolished. They did not, uh, they did not magically stay in that shiny condition that you see. So when we compare to a European sword, for example, the Dordogne uh, River swords, which are comparatively well preserved for river found swords, or even when we look at a sword like a coronation sword or a, um, a civic sword, like the sword uh, used for um, mayoral um, operations in York, for example, or Dublin, there are medieval swords that are in a relatively bright unrusted, uncorroded condition, but they are not as bright and shiny as Japanese swords because they haven't been repolished in the same way and to the same degree. Now this is a funny kind of elephant in the room when we're talking about swords as a whole, but we're treating that covering Japanese and European, and in some cases Indian and African and other swords as well is the fact that Japan has a culture of repolishing their ancient antiques. And this is not something that we generally do in India, in the Middle East, in North Africa, in Europe. We just don't do it because it's seen as destructive, certainly in the West. And to take, for example, a, a sword like one of the um, Castillon swords or the Alexandria swords that is in reasonably con good condition and send it to a Japanese sword polisher to have it polished to a bright mirror finish, yes, you would absolutely end up with the sword as bright and shiny as that example in the article linked below um, from the 12th century. However, it's not something in our culture that we would do because it would be seen as destructive. You have to remove material from a blade when you polish it. So absolutely, you could take a Viking era sword that's in reasonable condition, you could take a 15th century arming sword or long sword that's in reasonable condition, or indeed a rapier of the 17th century, and you could mirror polish it hand polish it by a qualified modern certified Japanese hand sword polisher and it would look incredible and yes you'd be able to see the structure in the steel which European swords have as well in some cases you might see edge uh, quenching 
somewhat comparable to Japanese swords, not exactly the same because we don't do, we never did clay tempering exactly, but you sometimes get harder steel located at the edge of a blade and softer steel towards the center. Um, so different types of steel essentially. And of course there's pattern welding. So absolutely you could take a migration era sword or a Viking, earlier Viking era sword and have it polished up by a Japanese sword polisher and you would be able to see the pattern welding like the day it was made. But the blade wouldn't be like the day it was made because you'd re removed material to achieve that degree of polishing. So, to conclude, for the aforementioned four main reasons, and you might be able to think of others, comments very welcome below. It is really uh, impractical and um, unreasonable to compare European sword states of preservation with Japanese states of preservation for a whole wide raft of reasons, I think more or less covered by those four that I have um, delineated in this video. But what I really want you to, to take away from this video, apart from those reasons, and what I want you to take above all others, is that when you see bright shiny swords in Japan, they have been either continually used or they have been severely repolished. Okay, and there is a point at which Japanese swords be can be polished so many times that they become tired, as it's termed, and they can't be polished anymore because they have lost too much material, essentially. European medieval swords are practically never, I have heard of it happening a couple of times for people to see the structure of a blade, but they are practically never treated in this way, they are never polished in that way, because it is seen, at least in archaeological and heritage terms in the West, that that would be almost sacrilegious to those medieval swords because we'd have to lose material from them in order to d gain that degree of polish, especially when there's any degree of corrosion or pitting to the surface of the blade, which in fairness the Japanese sword may never have had because it may have remained in continuous use. Um, so when we see um, Japanese blades like this, which is in mm, ish polish. It's shiny and you can see the ham on and you can see the structure, but it's not in you know really great final uh, polish, what would be expected of a, of a more serious Japanese sword collector than me. Um, but when we see these Nihonto in bright, bright polished condition, you have to bear in mind how many times has that been repolished in its life? Probably several, probably several repolishes in its life. If it's a 17th century blade like this one, it's probably been repolished, you know, five times in its life. And in some cases, if it's been allowed to get damaged, if the edges got chipped at all, or there are surface scratches, one or two of those polishes might have removed serious amounts of material. So what you see the sword now is not exactly the same as the sword as it would have been in the 17th century, even putting aside the fact that it may have been shortened at the tang and this kind of stuff. Purely the surface of it can be fresh and new and not original, sadly. Despite that, it is still amazing that we have these swords from Japan in such beautiful states of preservation and I am still, and I really, I don't want to undermine that article and that sword linked below. I find it absolutely mind-boggling and amazing that you can look at this gorgeously preserved blade in high polish that in fairness in that case probably hasn't had very much material removed to bring it to that polish because of the way that it was preserved in a temple. But just remember that we do have European swords in some uh, peculiar circumstances because they had um, ceremonial or civic or uh, religious significance or national sort of uh, hero significance and they were preserved in imperial armories and cathedrals and churches and monasteries and places like this and we do have some amazingly preserved medieval European swords as well. Thanks a lot for watching. I hope this has been thought-provoking. I'm very interested in reading your comments on this topic actually because I, I am by no means a uh, even any type of expert on Japanese um, swords, but I'm gradually learning more um, and building a small collection for myself. And they are a hugely interesting, deep, and very uh, complexly studied uh, topic, uh, in many ways more complex than uh, European swords, but I would say more less diverse. And I think it's too easy to make simple comparisons between European and Japanese when actually it's a much more complicated topic. Thanks for watching. Um, please give this video a like, share it around, and if you're not subscribed, please consider doing so. I have been Matt Easton, I'll continue to be, and I'll see you back here again soon. Cheers, folks.